Normally when we have snow here in the high desert of northern Arizona, most of the time it molts off in a couple of days unless we have a real large amount of snow. Mm -hmm. But it's different this time. We've been really cold. I mean, I think it was, it was warmer last night, I think it was 14. But the night before it was like eight. Yeah, it just doesn't melt as fast when it's that cold. The nice thing about it is if the mud gets muddy at all, you wait an hour, it's frozen solid and you can tiptoe out there and, <laughs> and it just goes crunch. <laughs> you know, the great thing about having this snow is because Irene stacked the snow that was in our front yard on top of the beds, we'll have more moisture go into those beds right. as that snow melts off and that's great. Right. You know, it won't be a huge quantity by, a, by you know, a measurement. I mean, when we figure uh, powder snow is usually worth about an inch of rain per foot. About that, right. Yeah. And the bottom of that was not powder. It was definitely squishy. So, you know, we're probably getting, I don't know, quarter of an inch, eight, half of an inch. But that's something that's soaking in nice and slowly. I, I especially covered up everything like the um, daffodils. So I want them to slow down a little bit. They thought it was spring. <laughs> yeah, they were starting to come up, which is not good. Well, it's okay if just the vegetation comes up, but if the blooms themselves are damaged, they're gone. That's it. They, you know, that's it for the season. Yeah, so daffodils only have one blossom. Yeah. And we want to make the most of that one blossom. I think there might be some newer fancy varieties that do more than that, but we have whatever they had at, you know, big box store a few years ago. And they're beautiful and we're very happy with them and we're not gonna transplant them or anything silly like that. It means that in the spring when we do get early spring, I mean, this is super early or late winter, when we do get uh, snow, I always pile it on top of the daffodils to make them think it's still winter. <laughs> and it won't hurt them, you know, to be hanging around in 32 degree snow. <laughs> now, in some winters, I've gone out and stacked a lot more snow on those beds. Oh yeah, this is only the second snowfall we had this winter that was really worth doing anything with. And the first one was mostly an ice storm, which is a total mess and never any fun. So, uh, cause I, I mean, when the dog is falling down, you know that it's, uh, it's slippery out there. Four paw drive. Yeah, I mean, and both the cat and the dog had trouble. They're both skidding around corners and everything else. So we obviously had to be super careful. So it was a delight this time to have what I call a normal snowfall which usually happens several times a winter here. Well, the thing is, okay, if you grew up in a household like you and I both grew up in, you were totally aware and competent with table saws and this and that and the other thing. And then of course you did cut a lot of firewood, so chainsaws and buck saws and all kinds of other stuff. And you could split logs and all this thing. When you start getting into alternative things, it was especially alternative building. Yeah. Building techniques are different from using what's called a stick frame or traditionally framed house. That's right. two by fours, two by sixes, making up the walls and the trusses and so on. Right. And we were delighted when we saw their work that they were, they were aware of the fact that straw bales are not structural. What I mean by that is you have to build a wooden frame and then you stick the straw bales in between them and compress them. And then they basically become a combination of walls and insulation and everything else together. And then you just have to plaster a cob or something on the outside and you can cover them so they look just like any old house. I mean, there's no, you have all the options you'd normally have, but straw bales are not cement blocks. I mean, we've seen people who thought that straw barrels were cement blocks before, and they're not. Uh, they do not have structure. They well, they, they, have, they have structure, but it's structure that is, generally speaking, not uh, able to be engineer sampled so mm -hmm. that you know exactly how much stress they can handle, what kind of tension they can go under, what right. kind of compression they can go under. And really the nice thing about what Brian is doing in their house is he's compressing those bales down, 
pretty, pretty firmly right. to kind of consolidate that to start with. Right, but he's got the well-designed wooden structure around it to hold the roof, to, to create spaces for the windows, to do all those things. He's not trying to kind of wing it. And, uh, and I was really glad to yeah. see that. Yep. Brian has an engineering background. I think he was a software engineer. And mm -hmm. I'm impressed by the amount of work that he's put into all the details that's yeah. going into that house. It's, it's delightful to see because I don't care what the technique you use is. We know people who've done straw bale. We know people who've built log cabins. We know people, you name it, we probably know, except for igloos, which are not permanent. Uh, <laughs> I, knew lot, I knew lots of igloos, but they were not permanent. If you don't do it right. Well, you're going to be doing it over, and you may be doing it over an awful lot. Yes, and it can be dangerous if you don't do it right. I mean, you know, if you've ever been hit by a straw bale that fell off of something. It can, they're heavy. It, it can do a whack. <laughs> yeah, it can. So it's been a delight to watch them. They're, uh, they've got the roof on now. Some places, oh, oh, and some years are different than others too. For instance, this year we really did not have much trouble with tomato hornworm. But at the garden club the other day, the comment was nobody had much trouble last year. And I'll tell you why, the moths weren't around. Whatever, for whatever reason, we just did not have those big blasted moths that uh, the sphinx moths are the source of uh, the tomato hornworms. And we had, I see, I saw them, but I think we had such a large population of flycatchers last year. And watching a flycatcher catch a moth is cool. I mean, it's like watching a bat catch a moth. It's, it's very cool. They're flipping in the air, the air and everything, zoom. And I don't know how much of it was that and how much that we had had. Sometimes in the winter time here, we will get a warm spell where you get a lot of caterpillars come out. And, and then they, it's spring. And then they get frozen. And then they get frozen. So we, yeah, right. We don't mind that. But because most of these are pest caterpillars, they're not butterfly caterpillars. But even our butterfly population was down last year. Yeah. So I suspect we had just had too many weird warm spells that confused them in, this, in the early spring where we'd had a bunch of caterpillars come out and we just lost that part of the population. In general, aphids are not a huge problem here. They... I suspect don't like how dry it is, to be honest. <laughs> About three years ago, I think, um, I left the row covers on late in the season. And when we came back from a trip, we discovered that the peppers under the row cover, and we frequently leave the row covers on at least the top of the plants during the summer, because if we have hailstorms, it protects them from the hailstorms. But my peppers were covered with aphids, which is something I had never, ever, ever had here before. So there, we have friends, for example, CB at CB's Greenhouse and Gardens mm -hmm. has God's own problem with aphids in his pepper house. Mm -hmm. It's clean them off, wash them off every single week. I don't know, it may be more than once a week, but he definitely has to do it every right. single week because they're that bad in his area. I don't remember hardly ever having aphid problems in California. Seriously, did not have aphid problems in New Mexico where we lived. So it depends totally on the year, <laughs> what you're growing, and your exact microclimate. I think that they like it when it's just a little bit more damp than it is here. Also, we have, as Henry mentioned earlier, there are some native plants here that tend to be attractive to them. We don't allow those native plants inside the yard. Just don't. Just don't. I don't care how pretty they are. I don't care anything about them. No because I do not want them to be attracting crummy bugs. <laughs> now, there are ornamental plants that a lot of people grow because they have beautiful blooms, they mm -hmm. smell nice. It's really kind of a refreshing plant to grow, and that's roses. Mm -hmm. And roses are susceptible to aphids. I mean, pretty much every place we've ever lived, aphids have been an issue, maybe not a problem, but they've been an issue. Yeah, I didn't have much problems in California with that. I had problems with uh, fungus there. So I just had to pre treat them. Yeah. Now, my longtime friend, Pat, who lives in Sunnyvale, has a real problem with aphids. No matter how he treats them, mm -hmm. he has aphids on his roses. Mm -hmm. And it's a source of... Annoyance. Real annoyance. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one of the reasons we've chosen to grow... Well... There were many reasons we chose to grow our cabbage family plants in the greenhouse this year, one of which was rodents. I just wasn't willing to fight that battle.
But in the past, when I have grown cabbage family of any sort, tatsoi, pak choy, um, cabbage, um, there's all kinds of little varieties that are Japanese or Chinese in origin. In the garden, I have to watch like a hawk for aphids. Now, I don't have that problem in the greenhouse. So it's just easier to grow in the greenhouse. And we tend to grow things in the garden that are productive, maximize the space usage, maximize the water usage. And it's like, I had somebody tell me years ago, oh, you're wasting your time trying to grow asparagus here. The soil's too crappy. The, you, you will have to run the hose all day, every day, and you still won't get anything. Okay, I dug a hole like three feet deep in the ground. You and Dan dug a uh, hole. Yes, it was hysterical. I was gone and, and I had no idea that Irene had planned to dig uh, literally a hole three feet deep. Right, we dug a hole three feet deep, a big hole, like four feet wide and eight feet long. Eight feet long. Yeah, and so it looked like we were burying a very large neighbor, <laughs> like a moose. <laughs> no moose here. No, no moose here. Uh, two elks, <laughs> how's that? Anyway, uh, so we dug that, we put hardware cloth in the bottom, and we built up interior walls of cement blocks, and then filled it with as much bought soil and the best soil locally that we could get, and a combination of stuff, and I top dress it every year, and we put uh, the roots, which we had gotten from Johnny Select Seeds, in and we've been eating them for years. I fertilize them every year. I top dress them a couple of times during the summer. I put more compost on top. But having those walls and the floor means the gophers don't get in. The main of our existence for all kinds of gardening are those... Blasted. Yes, <laughs> gophers. Yes. And in a recent show, we talked about walking in our flood area, our erosion plain, mm -hmm. and in that you could see that there were areas where we had good invasive grass cover mm -hmm. and areas where there was no grass cover, yeah. and every place we had no grass cover down on the flat, we had gophers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you really, they are impossible to completely annihilate. You can do pretty well with it. I'm with the old guy in Williams who liked to blast them with propane. I want to watch them fly about 15 feet in the air. Yeah, well, <laughs> we just want them gone. If we had any way to scare them away, we'd do so. Oh, yeah. But there's nothing that deters them. No, the problem is we are a smorgasbord of wonderful, tender, well-watered plants. And our, we were chatting with one of our neighbors the other day at the garden club, and he said he never saw a deer on his property before two years ago. Basically, they're moving their areas um, because there's not enough water, there's not enough feed. You know, we've, we're in a drought. We're in a drought. We're in a 20-year drought. At this well, 1,200-year drought, 1, actually. 1,200-year drought, yeah. But this is the worst part of it that they've seen in forever, and they re they're realizing it's bad. So that means the animals have to move. And we actually saw our first major damage in the orchard about four years ago for six years ago, six years ago, from them munching off the edge of branches. Oh, right, yeah. They Well, they munched off the edge of what was left in the orchard. The mm -hmm. gophers had killed. Most we of the had trees, 19 the trees. Most of them by that time were eight years, nine years old. Mm -hmm. The gophers ate the roots off of all mm -hmm. of them except for our peach trees. Yeah. And then? Well, we have one peach tree left right now. We'll see if it's still alive in the spring. You know, Suddenly, we had deer. When we moved here, there were no gophers. No, I had never seen a gopher on the front. We, we were covered with wood rats and kangaroo rats and all kinds of mice because we have multiple kinds of mice here and bunny rabbits. You can fence out the bunny rabbits. You can shoot the ground squirrels. You can trap the other rodents. But the gophers are underground. And I don't care what kind of traps or anything else you use. They are very, very difficult to... Uh, to control, and I remember, I forget the name of the person, it was a little old lady that uh, we used to know from the community center years ago. You bumped into, we bumped her to her someplace, and you said, hey, how's your garden this year? And she said, 
gone. Yeah. Gone. She said the rodents came in and just ate every stick. Ate every stick. Well, rodents are a long way from aphids. Yeah, they are. They're just another pest. So, but <laughs> You know what I think? Yes. What do I think? I think it's time to say be sure to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell. Until next time. Bye. bye. Keep brainstorming. Definitely. <laughs>